last night, a shooting happened in Las Vegas, a catastrophic one at a country music festival that I'm a, it's confirmed to kill at least 20 people and have wounded at least a hundred others. According to the Clark County Sheriff's office, uh, the man who did this is believed to have acted alone. And he was killed by police on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay hotel and casino across from Las Vegas Boulevard that according to CBS news, uh, I feel it's important to lead you off with this. It's my job to inform you, especially in our live format compared to uh, sometimes when we pre-tape this show. And it's my duty to inform you. It's my duty to keep you up to date on such things. And we've been doing this show since fall 2015. And I feel like we've come on the air or on podcast or whatever shape or form that this show, Wake Up War Chant or War Chant Radio, has existed and had to say something at the front of the show about a terrible tragedy way too many times within a course of two and a half years. Sports is a distraction business. You've probably heard me say that a thousand times. That's not to say sports isn't important. That's not to say sports can't play a role in our society, our culture, etc. But at the end of the day, we listen to sports so we don't have to listen to things like this. But... Sometimes when reality sets in and sometimes when things set in, there's only so much you can do before you say your thoughts, you tip your cap, and you give your thoughts, your prayers, your well wishes to all the families involved and the people who are in Las Vegas right now who went out for a country music festival, who must have thought that they were going to have a great time, and right now they're probably scared out of their minds. So keep them in your thoughts today if you by chance are one of those people. I hope you're safe. I hope you're okay. But I would feel remiss if we didn't start the show and address that. But we've got a job to do. As I said, we're in the distraction business. Let's talk a little bit of football, ladies and gentlemen. This is Wake Up War Chant. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Tallahassee, Thomasville, coast to Atlantic coast, time to wake up war chain here on 97.9 ESPN Radio, and it's Monday morning, October the 2nd, 2017. Hope it is a good one for you and yours, but you're currently listening to the voice of Ryan Kelly. I'm the before-mentioned director of digital media at warchant.com, and, well, we've got an interesting football game to dive into today, and we will most certainly do that in a second. But first of all, thanks so much for waking up with us here at 6 a.m. on 97.9 ESPN Radio or our own WTSM app. The TuneIn Radio app works as well. Podcasts on iTunes, Podcast Republic, WarchantRadio.com, YouTube. However it is, we thank you so much for doing that. And hey, by the way, if you like the show, you should rate and subscribe to it as well. It helps us out, helps you out. It's a win-win situation. Drew's not here today, kind of a last-minute weird thing. Uh, Might be back tomorrow, might not be back till Thursday. I'll keep you posted on that front. But, yeah, so so it's just me today rolling with you. But I shouldn't say that because next segment we have Jimbo Fisher talking with our own Gene Williams of WarChant.com as he's kind enough to do every Monday after an FSU game, win or loss. And we always respect Coach Fisher for coming in. And chatting with that, of course, this is the first time of the year you get to talk about a W. But before we do that, of course, I want to let you know that we can't do what we do without our friends at For the Table, Madison Social, Central Township, all right there in the heart of College Town. Kind of quiet front. No real emails to radio at warchant.com. No real big tweets to at Wake Up Warchant. You can tell it's a win. You can tell it's a W. You can tell it's finally in that column for Florida State, 26 to 19 over the Wake Forest Demon Deacons, but, well, <laughs> Florida State avoided disaster, but it didn't exactly answer any of the questions that you had about this football team. And first and foremost, you credit Wake Forest. They did all they could to make that upset a reality. They played well. They executed well outside of their turnovers. By Wake standards, that was about as involved as bb t Field is going to get. They really believed that they were going to do it, and you could tell they believed they were going to do it. They were 4-0, and riding high, and they smelled blood in the water against a Florida State team that had not won a game since literally December. It had been a while for the Seminoles. 
So they believed, they bought in, and sometimes when the other team buys in and you don't, that can be a problem. And soft factors are, but here's the thing, soft factors are not, you can't just sit here and tell me that the offensive line that stood up to Alabama a month ago could be pushed around by Wake Forest like that. There's, there's no way. None. And that's just one of the many problems that you'll get to point a finger at today. But I know injuries don't help. Brock Rubel coming in to replace Derek Kelly, yeah, that's not ideal. Uh, Landon Dickerson going down, not good. But remember, this is supposed to be this deep unit, and the depth of this unit is supposed to be its strength, that when one guy goes down because it is a war of attrition and it is football, another guy's going to be able to step right up, take their place, and move right along. Yeah, that's not what happened. That's not even what happened with the guys who are starting. How is a unit this deep? that held its own against the fastest defense in the country on September 2nd. I saw it. You saw it. It was on national television. Just about every college football fan who wanted to tune and see that game, which is just about everyone, saw it. That offensive line held its own against the Alabama Crimson Tide. Went toe for toe. Toe to toe, should I say, with them. And yet this Saturday, it gives up 17 tackles for loss. It gives up five sacks. And it literally has a head coach. Jimbo Fisher leaves the game, leaves the sideline, and heads over to the bench just so he can chew those guys out. And if you saw the ESPN feed, I'm sure you saw that as well. If you weren't at the game, or if you were at the game, make sure you go take a look at that. Jimbo Fisher was not a happy camper. He was slamming, slamming that dry erase marker into his board. And it's inexcusable. What happened there is absolutely inexcusable. And that defensive line, you know, Duke Edgefor, good player. Grant Dawson, good player. They're not three and a half tackles for loss apiece good. I'm sorry. And you can tell how it's bleeding over into the rest of this team. You know, our own Gene Williams says his five takes column, and that's up on Warchant right now. Hope to have him on tomorrow to discuss that a little bit. Hope to have Irish Chaffel on a little bit tomorrow to discuss his column as well. But Gene brought up some good numbers in that five takes column, which if you're a premium member, you need to go read. But even if not, I'm going to give you some of these. Offensive line, you think it's important? You think it impacts a lot of production? There are 130 teams in FBS. Here is Florida State's ranking in some key offensive categories in college football. They're tied for 126 in the country in third down conversions, 28.6%. They're 127th on scoring touchdowns when reaching the red zone. Ooh, we'll get into that one in a second, folks. 127th in sacks allowed. That's four per game. 130th in tackles for loss allowed, 10.3 a game. 116th in scoring offense, 18 points a game. 122nd in rushing offense, 97.7 yards a game. 119 out of 130 in total offense at 303 a game. Offensively, the rhythm just is not there. Florida State averaging 303 yards a game didn't get that this Saturday. 270. Patrick and Akers yard-wise had a solid day. They combined for 178 of those yards. It wasn't always perfect from either of them, but here's the one thing. If I am going to take away something from this offense and tell you, yes, that was a good thing, it's that Florida State didn't abandon the run, they kept going, and they were able to break a couple. Jacquez Patrick, of course, breaks that big 69-yarder that if it was anyone other than Jacquez Patrick touching that ball, he is gone. But the thing is, it still served its purpose in that he was able to break out of a point where you are pinned back deep, give Florida State some breathing room. Cam Akers had a long of 27 as well. They both had a role to play. They both got their touches, and that's a good sign. That's a really good sign. You need that going forward because you need that balance in your offense. But the passing game, yikes, it was not good. 121 yards to the air. James Blackman, 11 of 21. Once again, that ain't good. He came through when you absolutely needed him to. And first start, conference game, on the road, you give him the credit for that, especially when Auden Tate isn't completely a full go, when it's very, very clear that he's the guy that he's going to lean on, he's the guy that he's going to rely on. Uh, I give him all the credit in the world for that. He finds him in the end zone. You end up winning that game because of his arm, and it was a really nice throw too. But... FSU targeted six receivers three or more times on Saturday. That's a good thing. It's just a matter of finally getting that into those guys' hands. 
and one of the guys that of all those folks needs to step up, Nyquan Murray, Nooney, Buddy. You cannot have two total receiving yards. Sometimes the ball has to be thrown better to you, but when you are a veteran wide receiver, you have to, have to, have to get more involved in that offense. You have to catch more balls. Those routes have to be more reliable. That freshman is depending on you to do that. Already mentioned it, but red zone was atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. I tip my cap to the special teams, as I'm sure you do too. That was a great, great bounce back for Logan Tyler for the return game. Of course, Derwin James broke off a touchdown that was called back, opening kickoff of this game. And Ricky Aguayo kept you in this game, kept you on the board, and really is the reason you win this thing. But no matter how happy you are that you have yourself a consistent kicker again, at least for now, you have to get seven, not three. Seven, not three. You have an explosive back. You have a power back. You have a solid tight end. You have a couple big physical wide receivers in Tate and Gavin. You have a change of pace, smaller guy in Nyquan Murray. All these guys that a young quarterback can lean on, all these guys that he can rest on and trust in the red zone. But why does it only seem like Auden Tate, of all those guys I just mentioned, is the only one that's been consistently reliable through three games this season? Jacquez Patrick ends up getting a touchdown this year as well, but it ain't good when nobody seems to be able to trust this offense to score points. Nobody. Florida State opened as a one-point favorite against Miami yesterday. In almost the blink of an eye, the public moved that to Miami minus two. No one trusts this team. No one trusts this offense. And quite honestly, you can't blame them. Defensively, it was a so-so effort against an offense that runs through one guy. And, you know, you give John Wolford credit. 24 of 34, 271 yards, a passer rating of 131. That's pretty good. Plus 63 yards on the ground. He did everything that was asked of him. He didn't make a ton of huge mistakes. Even the picks and stuff like that was batted balls. It wasn't anything too crazy. But at the end of the day, Florida State was outgained by Wake Forest in this game that they won, by the way. 367 and 270. Walford's nice stats, of course, kind of helped that out. Dorch looked really, really good as the wide receiver. He goes over 100 yards. And Cam Serenier in big moments in that game, he's their big bailout guy. He was able to bail them out on a couple big plays. Florida State had to do a better job of covering that big playmaker. They overcame the initial punch. You give Florida State all the credit in the world again. They fell behind early. They found a way to win. They did what Florida State seems to kind of do in this era of the Jimbo Fisher era. But I'll say this. I already praised Dave Clawson. I think he came in with a good game. On the other end of the field for Wake Forest, Dave Clawson's weird decision to be conservative at the end of the game, run those three straight just kind of so-so plays, run the ball very safely twice, try to move the sticks on third down, doesn't work. Punts, sets FSU up at the 40, and immediately gives him that touchdown play. That is atrocious situationally. Absolutely atrocious. And everybody knows, I like Dave Clawson a lot. But for him to play not to lose as an underdog at home, instead of playing for the win and saying, let's ice this bad boy, I don't know what to tell you. That's rough. That ain't good by any stretch of the imagination. And here's the thing, as as we kind of have to wrap this up, because I know we've got a lot to get to today. FSU Miami could look completely different from this next Saturday. We could walk into Dope Campbell Stadium at 3.30 p.m. next Saturday. We could see a completely different ball team. The offensive line could hold up well. The defense could look stout start to finish. They could get out to an early lead. I don't know. But are you really expecting that at this point? I wouldn't expect not. Right now, the Knowles are who we thought they are. And who we thought they were after leaving that NC State game last week is a team with flaws, a team with a couple issues, and a team that, quite frankly, despite their talent, just doesn't seem to have it all together at the moment. Let's get you caught up with the real news in the world of sports, ladies and gentlemen. It's why you were sleeping. Hello. Good morning. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake me up. Good morning. 
Good morning. What happened last night? NFL scores for you from yesterday. The Jets beat the Jaguars 23 to 20 in overtime. Saints, oh, Miami, 20 to nothing. New Orleans in London. The Bills don't look now, but they should be undefeated. They defeat the Atlanta Falcons 23 to 17 at Mercedes Benz Stadium yesterday. 26 to 9, the Pittsburgh Steelers all over the Baltimore Ravens. The Bengals all over the Browns 31 to 7. Cleveland. By the way, don't blink. The Rams might just be good. 35 to 30. They go into Dallas, score a lot of unanswered points, and beat the boys in Dallas. The Texans all over the Titans, 57 to 14. The Lions defeat the Vikings 14 to 7. Of course, our best well wishes to Dalvin Cook, who looks like he has himself an ACL tear and is going to miss the rest of this season. The Panthers walk it off over the Patriots in Foxborough with a field goal, 33 to 30. The Cardinals defeat the 49ers in overtime, 18 to 15. Eagles in Los Angeles defeat the Chargers, 26 to 24. The Bucks get a win, 25 23, in a back and forth game against the New York Football Giants, who are still winless on the year. Finally, the Broncos defeat the Raiders 16 to 10. And the Seahawks, despite trailing the Colts at halftime, decided to wake up. Remember they were playing the Colts. And remember that they're supposed to be pretty good. Seattle wins that game 46 to 18. When we come back, our own Gene Williams chats with Jimbo Fisher on the other end. Here on Wake Up War Chant, 97.9 ESPN Radio. to wake up war chant here on 97.9 espn radio and we get to do it once a week after a game we tape it sunday night we run it first thing in the morning on monday and that is our post film review with head coach jimbo fisher and coach uh, 26 19 win over wake force that was a tough one that was uh hanging in a balance there to the very end uh i know getting a road win in the acc is never uh easy so what were your uh, just kind of general thoughts being able to leave leave wake thought, force they, thought the game would be just like that i thought they would play very good defense which they did uh we gave them but we had we had too many tackles for loss and gave up too much penetration had some plays we could have made we had two touchdowns taken off the board with penalties uh, which are very close i need to you know we're evaluating those right now see what we get with back from those but uh again i thought uh made some plays in the kicking game again had the touchdown call back of that was a shame had the one punt where he just he just shanked he just slipped out of his hand when he dropped it other than that he punted the ball well ricky was excellent our return game got us a big return and set up a touchdown and thought we had a touchdown uh, defense gave up a, a big so one third down long, and then they got stopped. Uh, did a good job for the most part. Got a critical three and outs at the end. Uh, offense made plays in the fourth quarter. Uh, ran the ball hard all game. Again, we had too many uh, negative plays as far as tackles for loss and, that, and uh, a couple sacks. But a hard fought victory that I knew would be very tough. I, I knew they were playing with confidence. I knew they'd come in here ready to play. The, the way that what they do on defense is always very good, with, like they were last year against Louisville, against us, against Clemson. Those guys all, for three quarters, always battled. You're very tough. and uh, But a good hard-fought win with a freshman quarterback. And, again, we're far from perfect. Got a lot of work to do. We know that. But it's a win. We learned how to win. We learned how to make a play. What I was excited about, we had you know we missed, had a t- uh, one of our backup tight ends missed a block on the third and one. And then we – but we – Execute a great punt down to the 10. Get a great three and out. Defense does a great job. And offense comes back and replies. It's one of the few times. Defense, offense, and special teams all played together at a critical time of the game to win it. And, Coach, it looked like you had a couple of your linemen go down. Just want to see if you have any update in their status. I know Derek Kelly went out in that first series. as was a big blow your left tackle. And then we saw Landon Dickerson go out. I don't know if he came back. or What's up with those two? He's off on, and Minshew went out, too. Both yeah. of them, they all went out at different times. They're all, uh, they'll all be day-to-day. Look at the injuries in which they had. They all, and they're all nursing some different little, uh, things inside. So we'll, we'll see as we get back from our we don't know yet. Okay. And you mentioned at the outset, Coach, and that was kind of the elephant in the room, 17 tackles for loss. You don't see that very often. You had five sacks. Obviously, there were some protection issues. When you went and looked at the film of Saturday's game, what was jumping out of you? Why was Wake Forest able to do that? So it's guys not being together. Like when the guard and tackle were zone blocking, if it, the guard being with the tackle or the tackle having to be so low because there's different times by where the backers at, how you got to do that, and them not communicating well. And I think, you know, early in the game, uh, gave up uh, once or twice. We got beat on pass pro. 
uh, inside. Uh, a couple times our tight ends got beat on cutoffs coming inside uh, on some tackles for loss. And, and just, you know, things, and it's basically what it was, things that we had worked on done, we got to do better. We got to play better, got to practice better because it was a game of extreme. We made plays. We, we had two, over 200 some yards positive rushing, which Wake is a hard team to run on because they always got extra guys in the box. But at the same time, we had too many negative plays, and that's the thing you can't have penalties, negative plays, and I say self-inflicted wounds that way. And, and also a couple times our back, you know, the young guys got to realize every now and then, okay, it's a one-yard loss or a one-yard gain. Don't try to make it every play not a touchdown. Sometimes you just got to stick it in there, and that's what goes. And, Coach, there was a, uh, a scene on TV it showed in the first half. You were on the sideline talking to the offensive line. It seemed pretty animated there. Do you, do you remember that? We what did. Was that? Yeah, that, we missed that a declaration about? on a critical play. Missed a declaration on a mic call on a critical play that, that we had, you know, on a third down, and we could have popped it up out of there, and we declared it wrong. We'd worked, you know, we'd worked on it really hard and, and had it there. We just, we just made a mistake on it, and they didn't do it on purpose, but I was just making sure my point got across. And your freshman quarterback getting his first win of the season on the road, Coach, and obviously not having the best protection at times, too. How did uh, James Blackman fare? He played solid. I mean, he had some things he could have done a lot better. Um, and, and, and some of his reads, getting the ball out of time, got to have better ball security, had two balls stripped in his hand. Luckily, we got him back. No matter what happened, you can't put those on the ground. we got to work on the ball security. Uh, but, you know, made throws in the, third, in, the, in the fourth quarter when he had to, stuck a ball under. Keith made it, when made the big play at the end. Uh, did some really nice things in the game. Still some things that he's got to learn, too. But, you know, also didn't have the critical turnovers that, that led to them being in a one possession game that, that could have turned it around either. So uh, we got to continue to grow. I think, and I say this with people, people don't understand this. The first start's really tough. Sometimes the second start's tough, especially when you have success. So you think, okay, I got to do better and better. And then how tough some of these games are and going on the road and playing a team that the way they play defense and what they do, uh, we got to do better. And then, you know, the other thing too, our wideouts got to play better. We got to play better wideouts too. We, we missed some critical blocks on some screens outside that would have been big, big plays that uh, we use a lot, and we got to do a better job there uh, with some back screens underneath and with those that would have really sprung out there big time that, that they've got to pick it up and play a little better in situations in there too. Coach, you mentioned the White House, and interesting that Auden Tate didn't play a whole lot in the first half, obviously coming back off that shoulder injury, but he made that huge 40-yard touchdown catch for you with a guy draped on his back. The interference was called, and he still came up with a touchdown. Just talk about him kind of gutting that thing out and coming through for you guys. Well, it is. That's what football is about. That's what, that's what this game is, and, and never going to be healthy and you know he was buying a little more than normal but you know he went out there and knew he had to play we knew we could use him in certain situations we thought he would play just like we said we didn't know how much till game day as much and we we got a gauge on it we tried to critical moments get him in there and, get, and make, make sure he was in the game and it was great for him and i think it's only great for him to realize what he's capable of doing great for our team that you know you see guys go out there and do that and i think it's, it's character building and team building other side of the ball, coach, defensively, Wake had some long drives, but also for the first time this season, you guys forced some turnovers and down the stretch. It really, I noticed in the fourth quarter, you guys had three straight three and outs, something you hadn't really done a whole lot this season. So kind of a little feast and fan, but you happy with how they performed down the stretch? They did. And again, they had veteran players on defense. And their RPOs, man, when you're on all those, I mean, every play is a pass and a run, and you've got to play all 11 guys hard like that. And it's very difficult. They were good at it. They hit some nice plays. They really good at their screen game, the quarterback run game. They do a little bit of everything. And, and, but we dominated the line of scrimmage for the most part in those situations. Got, got better at the coverage, created those situations. And again, having great trust in those guys the way they were playing in the second half in that fourth quarter. And I saw Jalen Wilkerson out there quite a lot in the second half. Was that just to give him a shot or was Josh Sweat hurt? Or what, what was you doing with that? A little bit of both. Jalen was playing better. Josh, you know, was, you know, having, he played a lot of plays, giving him a rest. Jalen had a couple of tackles, had a fumble recovery, which was good. And also, Jalen, just the day before, it was, it was great to see him do that. He had just lost his grandfather. He was playing with a heavy heart. He was very close with him. And I'm glad. it was great that his grandfather got to smile down and watch him play and play a great game and have some big plays in that game. Our thoughts and prayers go out with him and his family. A couple of players on that side of the ball. What are your thoughts on that? It's Matthew Thomas, who led you in tackles, had two sacks. Seems like he's Mr. Consistency. Also, Kyle Myers, you mentioned that turnover coach. He not only had the interception, he forced that fumble. So something you guys desperately needed. It really did. And also moving him into the slot, moving Derwin back to safety because you had a guy that was more, that was quicker like the guy they had in there. He played it very well, allowed Derwin to free up and make plays all over the field. Matthew was, he led us with 10 tackles. He had two tackles for loss and two sacks. And, you know, made a lot of plays that way. Get Matthew so athletic in space and, and uh, did a great job in that regard. And, and uh, you know, our defense, you know, got better and better throughout the game and, and made the plays when they had to. And, Coach, I'd be remiss if I did not bring up the special teams. You mentioned it at the outset, but uh, Ricky going 4-for-4 four for, four for you on uh, field goals, keeping you in the game all along and after he had struggled, obviously, in that first game. And you mentioned the returns as well. Special teams seems like it's really turning around. 
It is. We put a lot of time in it. We put a lot of live work in it. And Ricky, the first game, I keep saying the block wasn't him. The block was was on the protection, was not on him. And he missed the first one at NC State. Now he's made eight in a row and he's doing a good job. I thought uh, Logan Tyler kicked the ball excellent except for the one punt that he shanked. I mean, he, and he, it was all in the drop. He just when he went to drop, it come off the side of his hand. He got a bad angle, and he, he missed it. Otherwise, every punt was over 45 yards, 44 to 57 yards, and he hit one that it was inside the 10. Executed that perfectly and got us down to the 10 yard line. So happy there. Had a big return by Keith Gavin, which is set up a touchdown down 12 to three. Actually, had the one in the beginning for a touchdown, which was inches away. And you know, uh, we gave up one punt return a little bit. We got undisciplined in our lanes down there. We had him and had him perfect surrounded. But we'll continue to grow. We need to be a great special teams team, and we. Should should be, and we're going to continue to work hard on that. That yeah, first one you mentioned that Duran returned uh, the touchdown that was called back on the blocking in the back. I, I think they they officially signaled Frederick Jones, but it didn't look like I, I, I wasn't sure. I was on Jacquez. It, it was on Jacquez. They called it on Jacquez, so we'll, we'll, we're going to get a ruling back and see what we we'll see what we think. Okay, it was cool. that. And speaking of that, a couple of just odd calls. I'm, I'm curious, and we spoke at the outset before we got on the air, but just one of the they reviewed a penalty, but I guess there's a unique situation to that because it was something close to the line of scrimmage. Which you say is kind it of is. It balls, so, if a ball thrown behind or across the line of scrimmage, you judge it it's like a quarterback. If he throws it beyond the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage, so that's a judge. That's the thing. It is reviewable, it was, and then it was it was done appropriately by them. Just like the just like the targeting on Derwin, which well, was a good call. They, they, they flipped that. Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask you. So I got a because you guys have had so many questionable targeting calls that goes against you, and you had to be a little bit, honestly, were you a little bit surprised with that? It was obviously the right call, You like you said. No, I was surprised. nervous about it, but after I saw it on video, and then I talked to the official on the side, I said, just give me the interpretation of the rule. what does the rule say. And when he said that, I, I said, well, they should be able to do that. I mean, I was praying, and, and by what we saw, that's what it was, but you know, you never know what they call it. And it looked like, and I'm sure that's the way you coach the guys, because it, I'm looking at the replays, it looked like he turned away from the guy and put his shoulder into him, as you're supposed to do, instead of leading with his helmet. He did, and not, and not to, you know, try to wrap and try to hit from the shoulder pads down and not up to the head. And the last thing, Coach, you got uh, Miami coming in this weekend. Obviously, it's a huge uh, rivalry game, one of the best in college football. They're a perfect 4-0, and ranked number 12 right now. They're going to be sky high after you guys beat them seven times in a row. So wh- what are your thoughts on trying to defend the home turf against the Hurricanes? Well, I mean, they're going to have to, they're, like I say, they're going to feel they can come in and win. We're going to feel we can play well. And, uh, it'll be a great game. They're playing really well right now. We've got a lot of things we've got to clean up. So we've got, we've got to get busy and have a great week of practice. All right, appreciate it. Coach Jimbo Fisher joining Thank us you. here on Wake Up War Chant. Coach, good luck this week. Thank you, Gene. Thanks. Take care. Yes, Florida State just landed a five-star commitment. I don't see that anywhere online. How did you get that news so fast? I'm on the new warchant.com app. I get news updates and scores pushed to my phone instantly. How much does it cost? It's free. Just go to iTunes or the Google Play Store, type in Warchant, and install it on your phone. That's it. A free app that keeps me constantly up to date on Florida State sports and recruiting? Wow, that makes it incredibly easy to follow my Seminoles and never miss out. With the app, you'll also get quick access to all the stories and features on Warchant, including the ever-popular message boards that feature thousands of fans talking about the Knowles. Warchant.com, your your ultimate ultimate Seminole Seminole source. source. Welcome back to Wake Up Board Chant here on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Ryan Kelly here with you on Monday, October 2nd. Florida State, of course, victorious over the weekend, 26-19 over the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. Next up, the Miami Hurricanes. And as I mentioned in that opening segment, well, it's Florida State who opens this book favored within an hour, actually. They end up being the dog in this game. It's the Canes who are favored by two at Doak Campbell Stadium. We're definitely going to dive into that last week. When was the last time that Florida State was a dog to the Canes on its home field? It'd have to be 2011. If it's not 2011, you might even have to go back beyond that. But let's face it, it is what it is at this point. Miami's look better. They beat a really good Duke team at home on Friday in a place where a lot of folks thought they would stumble. Now, granted, you take a look at that box score and you think to yourself, hey, that wasn't quite as bad as it maybe seemed Duke's maybe not all that terrible but Duke made a lot of mistakes and they did and 
you give Miami all the credit in the world for capitalizing on those mistakes. But we're going to find out just exactly who this Miami Hurricanes team is, just like we're going to find out the DNA and just how tough and just how deep down does Florida State have it on Saturday. Let's make no mistake, 2016 was not going well for the Florida State Seminoles. They'd already stubbed their toe multiple places. They got embarrassed by Louisville. They'd lost at home to North Carolina, and it didn't seem like there was any way that they would beat Miami. They bear down, and they get a win that saves their season. I'm not trying to pump sunshine here. I'm not telling you anything like that, but here's what I am telling you. Jimbo Fisher teams seem to respond to this game as what you should if you're at Florida State and you play the Miami Hurricanes. Of course you should bear down and play them. I don't care what that program's looked like over the last 15 years. You have a winning streak. You have pride. You have that rivalry to play for. And that winning streak, you know, Miami's irrelevancy, that doesn't mean anything to the guys who grew up down there who just either grew up wanting to play for them or grew up wanting to beat them. And now they have that opportunity. 3.30 kick at Doak Campbell Stadium. I, for one, am excited. I think we're in for a fun one. I don't, because here's the thing, I don't know anything about either of these two teams. I don't think it's Saturday Night Football worthy, and honestly, it shouldn't be. And that's why I think it's a good call that this is a 3.30 kick from a college football fan's perspective, from a night game, from a fan's perspective, from an FSU fan's perspective. I get it. Having Florida State Miami not 8 p.m. for the first time since 2011 stinks. It's not a lot of fun. But. Miami almost lost to Toledo a couple weeks ago, or at least, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Here's what I should say. Miami was pressed by Toledo two weeks ago. Florida State hasn't looked good in the last two games they've played since their little sabbatical. And now it's the team that was projected to win the Atlantic versus the team that was projected to win the Coastal. And maybe a game that kind of salvages a little bit of the season for them. Because it, it's pretty clear to me that Virginia Tech's probably going to win the Coastal. And even then, the Coastal is a blood sacrifice for Clemson at this point. Unless Florida State just completely turns this around, Clemson gets upset a time, and then you take care of business in South Carolina, which again, is a super tall order. This is all about a grudge match. This game on Saturday isn't for a division title. It's Probably not going to be for a playoff spot for Miami. Sorry, Canes. Let's face it. This is a good old-fashioned grudge match. Start to finish, bell to bell. And I think at the very end of the day, if it can't be anything else for Florida State Miami, it's that. And the Canes have to for literally, what, the fourth straight year since 2014, smell blood in the water. Miami has to know that this is one of their last best chances. I feel like we say that every year. But the thing is, next year was the year that a lot of people slated. If Miami's going to break the streak sometime soon, it's got to be that one, right? It's got to be the one where Florida State's going to be completely rebuilding that defense. Offensively, yeah, sure, they're going to be pretty good. But you would think Miami, Mark Rick's tendency to have a star running back, run the football, throw it around a little bit, that would be the year. And now it looks like Christmas might come early for Miami. That's where, if you're Florida State, you have maybe a little bit of an advantage in this game and that maybe Miami, who mentally, coming into this game for these last couple years, has thought to themselves, we got this. We're going to beat this team. Are you kidding me? Of course we've got this in the bag. That's where I think you have a big advantage and that Florida State's just hungry at this moment. They're hungry for this game. At least, God, you hope so. If this team comes out flat against Miami, which it never has under Jimbo Fisher, the team always looks like it's come out ready to go, ready to play. God, who are you going to get up for? Who are you going to be ready to play? That's what concerns you about this weekend. Optimism meets pessimism meets whatever for both of these teams in a game that, quite honestly, could save a season, could sink a season, could make a season maybe a little something more if you're Miami. Mark Richt is in desperate need of that signature, signature win with Miami. And here's the thing about Miami. They play in the Coastal where, let's face it, the best ball hasn't been played over the last couple of years. And Miami has one rivalry game. 
won consistent rivalry games. Since Florida dropped them in the 80s, that quote-unquote signature win against a rival gives one shot at every single year. One shot. And that's the Florida State Seminoles. And that's why I feel like they've collapsed mentally, even under Mark Rick last year. After they lost that game, they fell off the face of the earth. Under Al Golden, it was an annual tradition unlike any other. Can Florida State turn the tide of battle, look ready, look sharp, look crisp in a game like this, maybe turn it around, and then maybe make Miami slide a little bit? Test their mental edge. Test what they're up for mentally. Because if they lose this game and then go on a little skid, well, it could be rough pickings for Miami. I know the schedule for Miami is not quite as tough as it has been after Florida State in years prior. But it's a good game. It's a game that has monumental importance, maybe if not on the national scale, has both teams in a really interesting spot. I'll tell you uh, real quick, uh, plan on doing winners and losers for a little bit in this segment, but of course, Florida State Miami week bears its own segment. But you know, Monday we like to usually think about, you know, who's the biggest winner, who's the biggest loser of the weekend. Woo, winner. It's Georgia again, folks. They're for real. They're good. Really, really good. And I'll tell you, another winner, I'll stay in the SEC East, it's Florida. You can say what you want, yeah, they don't look good. Yeah, they lost Luke Del Rio for the year. They keep winning these games. And I know what you're going to say. Ryan, they should beat Vanderbilt. I know they should beat Vanderbilt. Ryan, they should beat Kentucky. I know they should beat Kentucky. But they've done it. They've been pressed in every single one of those. And they've done it. And you can call them lucky. You can call them whatever you want. But they've kept winning. And heck, that's more than we can say for the team that we watch on a weekly basis. At the moment... That Florida-Florida State game looks like it's going to be rough to watch. If you are a casual fan of college football and a fan of neither team, I would avoid it like the plague. That's just me talking. But that being said, winner, Georgia. Winner, Florida. Loser, USC. What a game on Friday night. I missed the second half of that guy. I ended up going to bed. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wazoo, how about it? Maybe an undefeated Apple Cup in the future? Who knows? Other loser, got to go straight back to the SEC East. I'm feeling pretty good about my hot take that by Tuesday at noon, Butch Jones isn't the head coach of Tennessee. I said that on Friday's show. And man, how miserable. How absolutely miserable to on Rocky Top for the first time in in decades, be embarrassed by another team at home the way you were. Champions of life don't do that, Butch. That's all I'm saying. We're putting a ball on it after this. It's Wake Up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Welcome back. We're putting a ball on it here on Wake Up 4 Chant 97.9 ESPN Radio. I mentioned it a little bit while you were sleeping. What a tough break for Dalvin Cook, who looked like he was really starting to get the ball rolling, had that great game against Tampa Bay last week, came out, looked like he was going to have another sharp game against the Lions. And I don't know if you've seen the video, but if you're any bit squeamish, don't. Because you know something's bad. As soon as his foot hits the ground, he had 66 yards on 13 carries yesterday and a touchdown. And, well, it was feared, and it looks like it's pretty much going to be the worst. Dalvin Cook tore his ACL, folks. He's going to miss this season. And it's an absolute shame that with all that hype, all that stuff. And he was proving a lot of those draft scouts wrong, hearing so many of them talk about, you know, he's not athletic enough. He's not athletic enough. He's not athletic enough. What are you talking about? Have you seen this kid play? Of course he's athletic enough. So he finally gets a chance. He proves some of these doubters wrong, has that great game last week, gets out to a good start this week, and then that happens. And I just feel so terrible for the guy that, you know, it wasn't the lack of athleticism. It wasn't all that. It was the injury past that ends up sinking Dalvin 
in his rookie season, and I hate that for him. Speedy recovery wished for you, DC4. Hope it go all goes according to plan. Knowles in the NFL. It's been a fun one, of course. A lot of pundits talking yesterday. Xavier Rhodes might be the best corner in the NFL. And honestly, you can't really... Well, I mean, you could say a couple names, and one of the names that you debate with him is Jalen Ramsey, who's looked really, really good through these first couple weeks of this season. I thought it was a really fun weekend of football, period. I mean, you saw a lot of Knowles show out in the pros. You saw some really fun games in college. Of course, Clemson, Virginia Tech kind of ended up being a dud. Wasn't a whole lot of fun, but uh, maybe, at least I hope you did. I hope you switched your TV over to the other game, the Big 12 game going on at that point, because Oklahoma State and Texas Tech played a wonderful game. And Oklahoma State, of course, still live in the playoffs and in all that mix, barely escaping Lubbock. It's weird to see Texas Tech have a good defense. Can, can I just say that? It's it's weird to not see them have to win games by outscoring folks like 65 to 60. Seeing them, well, 35-28, which of course, Big 12 standards is pretty decently low scoring. And that was a lot of fun to watch. I'm, I'm not going to lie. That was a really good football game. And you had a weekend full of good football games, to be honest with you. That SC Washington State game we already mentioned, of course, you know, objectively, Florida State Wake Forest, a back and forth affair. Good football game. Kentucky barely holds off Eastern Michigan, by the way. Stanford, Arizona State played a good game. Auburn and Mississippi State, not so much. Troy and LSU. Orgeron. Buddy, what's going on here, man? What are we doing? How on earth? How on God's green earth are you going to sit here and tell me that that guy, that guy was the right guy for that job after you lose to Troy 24 to 21? Interim coaches, man. And it's weird because Coach O did a good job as the interim. He did a good job at SC. But every time he seems to touch a program and take it over, it goes south. Uh, Look at that Ole Miss situation. I was one of those people who thought, you know, maybe he should get that job at USC. Maybe he did earn it at LSU. But regardless, of course, 41-34, I already mentioned Oklahoma State, Texas Tech. Texas A&M, Kevin Sumlin survives another week, 24-17. Virginia Tech makes that game look a little closer, by the way. 31-17, your final score. Clemson, boy, they look like they might be the best team in the country. They really do. And I know I saw Alabama in person, and I was really impressed with them. But the Clemson Tigers, man, even without Deshaun Watson, the fact that they're able to do this, it's all really, really impressive. But that'll do it for us today. You're going to hear from more of our War Chant friends tomorrow. You're going to hear plenty more stuff. Mike and Mike's up next. Hold on. It's Wake Up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.